Hello, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Badminton Podcast, proudly sponsored by Volant Wear. My name is Henry. I'm Jeff. And we're the founders of Volant Wear. And, you know, badminton is a sport for everyone. And what we'd like to do on this podcast is to share stories from social, competitive and professional players so that people can get an idea of what it is like to play the sport and what the sport can teach you in badminton, of course, and in life. Also, we offer badminton players an alternative to the, un- like the, to the conventional, bright and unsightly badminton wear so that they can feel confident and stylish anywhere. So feel free to jump onto our website, www.volantwear.com and, and shop, as well as check out a lot of good resources on how to be a better badminton player and you can follow us on our journey too. Uh, if you want to find us on social media, it is Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R, or on Instagram via The Badminton Podcast. Now, I'll move on to Jeff, who will introduce our guest for this episode. Thanks, Henry. Um, we've got this really good-looking guy here on the screen for those <laughs> watching the video. Um, his name is Rajiv Rai. So, look, Raj was born in Atlanta, Georgia, where there weren't many courts available, let alone badminton coaches. And after he watched the 1996 Olympic Games in his home city, which was in Atlanta, he dreamed of being a part of the Olympic Games. His childhood dream was in the making as he moved up the ranks in the US and the world, achieving a world ranking high of number 37 in men's singles. Then in 2008, he achieved his biggest goal as he qualified for the 2008 Beijing Olympic Games. Unfortunately, due to a severe injury of his knee, he was forced to retire soon after that, which was a life-changing moment for him as he switched from coaching so sorry, he switched from playing to coaching and he dedicated his life towards helping and inspiring young athletes. His passion and purpose have grown far beyond just teaching the skills of badminton. For him, it's about instilling the right attitude, gratitude and mindset so that his players can leave a positive footprint on the world. Raj, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Very welcome. It's an honor to... Uh to kind of join you guys on this, on this mission. So it's a pleasure. Yeah. It's, it's been a long time since I saw you. We, we last saw each other in 2016, but prior to that would have been about in 2008 when we were both qualifying for the the Beijing games and I didn't make it, but you did. So congratulations. (laughs) Um, We saw, saw each other at a really good friend's wedding, Eric Go. So I've, I've told Eric to come on the podcast many times. He said yes many times, but he's never actually booked in. So, <laughs> so am I the first? Am I the first American badminton player to make it? Uh, no, we've had a we've had a couple yet, Henry. We've had. Um, I think we've had about four. I mean, as far as professional badminton players are concerned, um, you've probably Second. been highest ranked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. highest ranked. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Raj, you know Vincent as well. Oldest. I'm probably the oldest. I'll tell you that. Oh, we, yeah, we had a, we had one with badminton Becky. Do you know badminton Becky? No, I haven't heard it. Oh, she moved to, yeah, that's a whole nother story in itself. But first question for you, Raj, look, during those times where we were competing with each other, your name on all of the jaws was Raju, R-A-J-U, Rai, your surname. What's going on there? Um, so your your full name's Rajiv. Was why was it Raju, uh, and why don't you go by Raju so much these days? Uh, great question. Um, well, my legal name is Rajiv, so that's the name that my father gave me. Um, he's from New Delhi, India, and um, when I was growing up as a kid, he always called me Raju. So I never was called by the name Rajiv. Um, and that's kind of why you see through my badminton career, it was always Raju. And then the kind of nickname grew on me, uh, as Raj. And, um, as I kind of phased out of my, uh, um, you know, professional badminton career and into coaching, and then now I'm kind of dabbling in the corporate world. I kind of felt like, um, Raju was really tied to, um, my badminton career. And really, I wanted to kind of go back to my roots and like uh, honor that name that my father gave me. 
So I feel like um, as we kind of go through life, for me, badminton as an athlete was like one phase of my life. And um, there's, you know, there's multiple phases as we kind of evolve and grow. And I felt, well, that's kind of where Rajiv comes into play is like, this is the whole, this is, this is the whole uh, version of myself, not just me as a badminton player. So that's kind of why I go by Rajiv now. Yeah, cool. Is there like a transcended version of you next? Like it, what's after Rajiv? <laughs> um, I don't know about that, but uh, I'm working my way, you know, uh, I've been uh, kind of blessed. To, there's, there's been quite of like inspirational people around me um, and a lot of them in a way have, and this might sound a little weird, but some of them are like celebrities, like uh, I, uh, Oprah Winfrey, I've uh, watched a lot of her in the last few years, and she's a huge inspiration for me. Um, DJ Khaled on just how he can uh, always have those positive vibes and affirmations. And um, recently, Kobe Bryant, too. Like, mm -hmm. uh, growing up, I was a huge Michael Jordan fan, so I was almost like I had to hate on Kobe Bryant just because um, to submit – uh, Michael Jordan's legacy as the greatest ever, right? I always had that in my mind. And um, I was never close to Kobe, but the funny thing is like, um, you know, when he kind of, when he went to heaven, it just dawned on me like, wow, I want to do what this guy did after he left basketball and mm -hmm. the amount of lives he touched and kind of how this mission he went on to give back to, to future generations of players, whether whether it's in movies or entertainment, kind of like he, he just, it was so strange how much he inspired me from that day. And um, that's kind of what I see myself transcending towards is kind of following in these, like uh, these big names footsteps, you know? That's awesome. And we got really deep in straight away. And <laughs> well, yeah, and Raj, it's something we're definitely going to talk about as to what you're doing now and what you've done to, to try to live and start living that legacy that you want to leave behind. Yeah. But first of all, in the introduction of you, we did talk about the 96 Atlanta Olympic Games and actually my first coach in badminton, he went wow. there. He, he was a, he was a Australian badminton player that played at the 96 Atlanta Games. For you, how did your badminton story start and how did you get to 2008 and then move from a player to a coach? And yeah, just a bit of a background as to where you've come from in terms of badminton. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let me know if I go way off because sometimes I dive deep in, but... Um, no, let's, let's no, please go. Do. Let, let's please jump. Do. Let, let's let, do let's it. dive. There's no <laughs> other way to dive, man. Just, sure. just getting deep. <laughs> 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 well, kind of like in the bio that you went through, um, I grew up in Atlanta, um, the very small badminton population. I grew up playing badminton once or twice a week in like a community center. And, um, I always wanted to gear, like I played all the American sports, baseball, basketball, tennis, football, you, you name it. I've tried it. And I actually really loved basketball, but, uh, badminton was my dad's passion. And he was the one who kind of, I wouldn't say he forced me, but, you know, he brought me along with him to play a lot. And um, I was really blessed because in Atlanta, the badminton clubs, it's all adults. There's no kids, there's no juniors. Um, mm. So for them to play with me when I'm a kid and I'm learning, like it's gotta be challenging because I'm not at their standard maturity wise or level wise. And, you know, um, they kind of nurtured me to, to grow and improve. And, um, I guess the first big moment was when I was trying out for my eighth grade basketball team and I didn't make it. And then my dad came to me at that time and he was like, you know, you have to make a choice. Uh, like obviously you see where you stand in basketball, but as badminton at that time, I was already a junior national champion. Okay. So he kind of, um, forced and kind of, he, he showed me that, okay, you have a, you have a talent, you have a gift for badminton. And I think that you need to kind of hone in on that and really channel that and see where it can take you. And from that conversation, um, I had a few more national titles and then, uh, here we are coming to about 1996 in the Olympic games. 
And uh, my mom and dad were volunteers at the Olympics. They were like uh, scorekeepers and like stat trackers showing how many like smashes or how many shots per rally oh, cool. and these kind of statistics. So they, they were able to get me um, like free seats, front row seats to watch the action, right? So this is when I get to see the legends like Paul Eric Hoyer Larson, Susie Susanto, Ricky Rexy from Indonesia. Mm-hmm. like, And then, um, you know, growing up, I'm sure you guys see this in Australia, like badminton is a really small sport there's not a huge crowd watching like Mm -hmm. you don't feel the superstar kind of atmosphere Mm -hmm. and when I sat in that front row and the fan like the crowd is packed right then I'm like holy smokes these guys are superstars you know this is what I want to this is what I want to be like that's what got me hooked you know so from that day I started dreaming like man I want to go to the Olympics and I think this is kind of how my father planted that seed in me and um, I think the first big chance that I got was in 1999. Um, Artie Wiranata was our national team coach. Um, and he selected me to join the national team at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. So at that time, I was 16 years old. I had an opportunity to leave home and just train badminton all day, every day while I go to, to high school. And I think that was like the first kind of life changing moment because you're around all these, you know, every sport has their superstars and superheroes and you're mm-hmm. kind of just surrounded by them. And I, I do think that a lot of these things just I'm just so lucky to be put in those positions. Like uh, when I got to the team, I have, you know, these um, I was like one of the youngest on the team. So we have older players like Kevin Hahn, Mark Mena, Howard Bach, Bob Malathong. Eric mm-hmm. Go, you just have all these like super talented people at the top of their game that you can learn from. And uh, I think that was really what took me to the next level there. Yeah. From there, I also had an opportunity to connect um, and become good friends with Apollo Ono, which is a, a speed skater, okay. like the most decorated American speed skater. Um, and he's just phenomenal. Just at such, he was 18 at that time. And at that age, the way he took care of his body, how he mentally prepares, um, it was just amazing to see an 18 year old be a world champion. And Mm -hmm. like that, I think just having that group around me really, um, guided me in the right direction. Um, from there, I went to another Olympic training center in, uh, Lake Placid, New York. Um, after our program got shut down, I got shifted to, um, OCBC. Uh, which is in Orange, California. And that was kind of the first major private club that took U.S. badminton to the next level. Mm -hmm. And uh, a big thanks to kind of Mr. Chu um, and and the Chu family for giving me that opportunity because that brought me to Tony Gunawan, who um, in my eyes is the greatest badminton player ever, especially for doubles, that is. And um, he was the next guy to kind of be my hero and um, kind of shift me and guide me towards the next direction and training under, under him at OCBC for four years kind of um, got me to the top of the national rankings and become a national champion. And also that's when I started to explore the, um, the circuit of the, you know, the international events Mm -hmm. from there. BWF had a world training center, which I got selected to in 2006. And um, at that time to train with, um, you know, you have like the best player from each country uh, training together, working together under the guidance of a Korean coach, Mr. Kim and Swedish coach per Henrik Krona and another Korean lady coach. um, uh, Now, now her name is slipping my mind. Um, I don't know but, that actually. Uh, it'll come to me as we keep going. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was suddenly <laughs> shouted out a bit later. Kind of as we went through that process um, in the BWF training center, then I kind of really got exposed to the European circuit and really what it took to be a professional. Cause at that phase of, your, of my life, my career, I was kind of competing every weekend as you were as well. Like when we were going through the mm-hmm. Olympic qualification process. Yeah playing about a a tournament every 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 week week. yeah 
And then I had a, I had an extremely like big knee injury um, there that sidelined me. So when I hit my number 37 world ranking, I was climbing the charts. Like I had my biggest win against uh, Andrew Smith from England. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had a, a huge comeback in a Thomas cup against uh, Bobby Milroy. And yeah. right after that, I, I tore a, a hole in my cartilage in my right knee. So I was, I was sidelined for six months for PT. They couldn't figure out what was wrong. Then I had a microfracture surgery. They repaired it and I did another six months of, of therapy. And by that time, it's 2007, May 1st, Olympic qualification period starts and my 37 ranking in the world was zero. Mm. So that was an extremely stressful full time I was about 60% back but I had no choice but to kind of like try and grind it out and I mean if anybody who's gone through the Olympic process it's really a grind mentally physically emotionally I mean you just name it you're gonna feel all the highs and lows and ups and downs and I'm just thankful that I got the opportunity to get to the Olympics and um it, when you're there, it goes by so fast, but that journey was just so special. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've had other um, players on the podcast about the emotional, the emotional toll of Olympic qualification. And I, and I know full well about that as well. Yeah. Um, Raj, I just wanted to go back a little bit to when you were first sitting in front of the top players at the 96 Atlanta games. And one of the things Henry and I talk about commonly is that a lot of people, I know you're already the, the, the junior national champion or the national champion in your age group already. So you already knew badminton. But for the people who don't know badminton and they don't have the chance to sit in front of a court and see these players play, then they really can't see how awesome and amazing the sport actually is, right? And that was, that was something that when I heard you say that, I thought, yeah, we need more people to see what you saw at, at a young age and see how it looks to be a superstar of badminton and how there is that kind of superstar environment there because, yeah, it, it's absolutely awesome. And, and I know you talk about Oprah and um, Kobe and um, Khalid and all those people that have really inspired you. One of the people that I listened to a lot was Tony Robbins. And I'm not sure if you know any of his work or you like any of his work, but one of the things that he says is proximity is power. And that's all I could think about when you were telling your story. You had the proximity to the players. I know it was only for one Olympic Games, but then you had proximity to the the, the national coaches. Um, you had proximity to Tony when he took you in. You had and then at the training camp, which it's funny, we just got off a podcast a couple of weeks ago with Kestis. And we were talking oh, about how wow. awesome the the training camp was with you, Kestis, Raul, and all the all the boys. Um, yeah. But you've had this proximity all the way, and that's yeah. really helped you push your level and push you to be who you are today. So, what would you say for someone listening? The import. What would you say about the importance of that proximity? Do you agree that it is huge? I do. I mean, I uh, can't remember the title of this Malcolm Gladwell book. Do you remember that Malcolm Gladwell? I know book? the author, but yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. But he, he pretty much talks about that as how like, uh, I mean, he goes into more depth of how, you know, these people that are born in the first four months of the year, they have like a competitive advantage because um, you're you're older than the other people that are born later in the year so when you guys are competing you kind of have this advantage and year after year you get this trickle down effect because because i'm winning i'm getting selected to camps i'm being more exposed to these players Mm -hmm. so i definitely do feel that that does play a factor another thing that i like what you said was um it's this proximity right and i think this is where badminton has to go to another level is like before we call these, these uh, they're called badminton tournaments. And I think what it's, what's important to do is kind of we need to transform these into events. Like tennis mm. has events. They don't have tournaments. Yeah. And I see that now. We see that on an international scale. But I think if you compare it to like America or Australia, a lot of times we're having tournaments. And how we kind of stage the finals or how we kind of um, – what's the right word, empower our, our top, our top athletes, right? It's, it's really important because we need, we need those kids that don't know badminton well, or the just 
normal spectators who don't know the sport well, they, they just need to feel that energy and that vibe, that environment. And um, I see our sport going in that way. I think it's just in the, the countries that are kind of catching up. It's really how we, we need to showcase those talents because, I mean, we have talented players in, in all of these countries. It's just, I believe it's how we showcase it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree entirely. I think a lot of the times in countries like ours and probably yours, Raj, as well, is that yeah, the people that go to the badminton tournaments are people that play badminton or are involved right. in badminton. And if right. we can turn these um, tournaments into events, then hopefully we can attract outsiders and welcome others into the sport and they can actually get that that moment that you got, you know, maybe not at an Olympic level, but at least at a professional level so that they can be exposed to the true world and what, what it really is like to be a badminton player. Yeah. I'll tell you guys a funny story. When I was growing up, even though like I was a junior national champion and sometimes you get put in the newspaper, like I was embarrassed, to be honest, I was embarrassed of being a badminton player. Because growing up in Atlanta, like mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a top three major sports that's going to, that's going to uh, make you popular in school. So I hid that for many, many years. Like no one knew in my class what I did until one, one day the teacher saw an article in the, in the paper and she, she posted it in the class. Oh, what and did then you? I was like super embarrassed, but mm. I think we, it's really important for us, you know, to change that um, for the future generations like we need to tell them how special they are so mm -hmm. that they, they're not um you know they're not embarrassed to tell their their story and kind of what they're doing so yeah that's cool and did I, you find that when the teacher actually showed the class that was a lot of it in your head like did yeah. people did people come to you your friends and your classmates say whoa that's that, i didn't know that about you that's awesome and all of a sudden you're thinking wait I, I thought that I'd be embarrassed. I, I know that you, you were, but did you yeah. find that it was all in your head? Definitely. Like I thought they would make fun of me, but mm. in reality, they were all like super supportive and amazed. But then there's still this negative thing in my head because um, in an Indian culture, you're taught to be really humble. Yep. So um, I think that hurt a lot with my confidence now that I'm older and I kind of look back is because when, when people will tell me, wow, you're so great. You've done so many good things. I would always say like, uh, you know, like there's lots of people that do good things. Yeah. yeah. And, um, kind of now that I can reflect more, I definitely think that, um, it's important for us all to, you know, acknowledge ourselves and appreciate the good things that we do. So completely agree and even to this day and age there's i still have that chatter as well and i have that chatter in terms of yes i've done i've done some cool things in my career that i'm super happy about but then there's always this other one saying yeah oh but but um you were in australia there wasn't that as many good players you went in malaysia you went in china like yeah. well, who are you and I, I still got that sometimes and mm -hmm. i'll be completely upfront and honest just about a podcast or just about if henry and i are releasing a video about how to do a different footwork or like how to pick a racket there's always this little bit of chatter thinking yes i've done this but is it really good enough and yeah, yeah and just being yeah like i said absolutely open that i still have that chatter in my head and i just heard something literally this morning about ants automatic ants automatic <laughs> negative thoughts ants wow. everyone's got yeah. ants it's just yeah. being able to manage the ants because there's no yeah. such thing as anyone not having ants um yeah. i literally heard that this morning <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna Perfect. use that. So that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. So didn't ants, know where you were going with that. Ants are everywhere. Ants are everywhere. <laughs> Don't worry about them. <laughs> yeah. So Raj. So now you you've been at the Olympic Games, which is an amazing experience. I've heard all about it and how like you'll never forget it, and you'll never give anything up to. Yeah. Whatever you gave up in that time was all worth it. To, to get there in the end. And then with, with the knee injury, you've had to step back from playing after the games and, and move into coaching. What was that transition for you like? To be honest, it was, it was very, very difficult. Um, 
So as an Olympic athlete and you're in the sport of badminton and I wasn't at the top of the sport. So financially, you don't, there's just really no opportunities to, you know, make a living to support your career. So when the, when the games ended, you know, I'm at a crossroads. What do I want to do? Uh, do I go back to school? Do I try for another quad? Um, mm -hmm. Or the only thing that I knew what to do, like career wise was like, okay, let's try it. Let's try coaching. And uh, I've done a little bit of that before at that time, but I never thought it would be become a career. And um, I got the opportunity to be the head coach of Bellevue Badminton Club. And man, that was huge. Like from there, I kind of realized to win, like as an athlete to win, it's such a great feeling, but to coach someone and have them win, mm -hmm. it's like times 1000. And I think I just got addicted to this. In the beginning, it was still too much of winning because when you come off the circuit, you're just, yeah. that's what you're, it's ingrained in you. Like you have to be the best. Like, so I think in the beginning of my coaching career, I was a little bit rough and tough on the, on the players, but it was because I saw that talent in them and like, I knew they could be the champion and, um, so it was just so rewarding in the beginning, just um, to help others win and improve. And, and you know, as I gradually got better and, and throughout the years, I, I realized that it's, it's, more than just, it's more than just winning. It's kind of helping the, them develop on and off the court. And um, you just get to see them grow and be a part of their journey. And like, man, coaching is so special. Like I'll always be involved. It's just, um, it's just a really cool thing. And then you still get to be a part of the sport and you still get to channel that competitive nature and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, travel and still you get to see your old friends, even though they're competing and you're not. And, you know, yeah. you, you go on the circuit as an assistant coach and it's just nice to see the same faces. You know? <laughs> it is really nice. And even if you're, com you're coaching against each other, uh, have you have, have been in that situation? Trash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trash talk. <laughs> All that trash talk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, it, it's it's great to see familiar faces. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So in terms of your coaching as the, the head coach, where was it in Bellevue? It was in Bellevue in Washington. Like oh, in Washington. Near Seattle, near Seattle, Washington. Bellevue okay. Badminton Club. Sure. How, how long did you stay there for? And did you make any transitions or movements from there? I was there for about a year and a half. So, um, during that time, it was, it was a great time. Um, I think when I came to the program, we had five badminton courts and about 70 kids. And when I left, we had about 10 courts and over 200 kids. Oh, so I mean, the credit doesn't go all to me. They had an incredible team there. Um, mm -hmm. and we were just able to kind of really grow the program and add, add some structure and we were lucky to have some top, you know, talented juniors who were like starting to win medals in these competitions. And that kind of goes back to the proximity factor where the, these kids in Bellevue now are seeing like, Hey, my big brother, my big sister, they're winning, they're winning titles. Like they're, they're national champions. And uh, the program took off. And now um, Seattle is one of the top programs in the country still to this day. Fantastic. Yeah. Talking about that program, how, how did you find scaling it? Cause I mean, it seems like you're almost tripled in size. Is, was there anything in particular that actually helped with growing the program and the, the participation? Was it, was it really the, the proximity um, to be proximity to all those great you know, juniors rising? I, th I would say it's that. And I would also just say the quality of the work, the quality of the people uh, within the organization, like, uh, Everybody had a good heart. Um, I mean, the, the students came first. And I think when parents see that and the students feel that, I mean, the results just show. And really, that's just how we grew. It was pretty much all word of mouth. And this person tells their friend. And it just it was just crazy how it blossomed. Mm. Yeah. So after that, where did you head off to after you were there? Because you said you were there for one, one and a half years. Yeah. So after that, I was in a lot of conversations with uh, my best friend, uh, Bob, at the time. 
And kind of the one things that we struggled with was, um, you know, we had just left the Olympics and the training center and we're just used to this competitive nature. And um, I think we both wanted our programs to, we were young at that time. So we were a little immature, at least I'm, I'll speak for myself. I felt I was <laughs> immature and patient. Uh, Bob, un- Bob's, Bob's always immature, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hope he's listening to this. No comment on that one. <laughs> um, but I was immature and impatient and I was away from family. And I think that that took a toll on me. So we decided to kind of team up and uh, start our own uh, kind of like our own training team in the Bay Area. And that was around 2010. And then that's kind of uh, why I'm still here in the Bay is just uh, we had this mission to kind of make the best badminton club in the country or at least among the best in the country and kind of work with these top juniors and hopefully inspire them to want to go down the same Olympic path as us. Um, Obviously we didn't realize how much smarter they were. So uh, school, they had a lot of options for, for going to go, going to go to great colleges. Mm -hmm. Whereas us growing up, um, we prioritize sports. Like that was our way out. Um, And for these guys, they have a lot of talent and opportunities and different avenues available. Um, But yeah, from that point, we came to the Bay and uh, we got a chance to work with um, uh, Golden Gate Badminton Club, with CBA, and uh, most recently, uh, Synergy. Okay. And just for all us non-US residents, where is the Bay Area? Oh, nice. It's a (laughs) area. So, um, it's kind of that general San Francisco area. You can call it San Jose, Cupertino, uh, San Francisco. So that's NorCal. NorCal. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Not so, is it SoCal? SoCal. It was like NorCal. SoCal and NorCal. Yeah. 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 Is there a reason why you chose NorCal? <laughs> um, Badminton was booming up there at that time. So South SoCal had always dominated. That's where I was training at OCBC and kind of um, SoCal kind of was like the melting pot for the professional players and NorCal was the melting pot for the junior players. So yeah, okay. since we were uh, more kind of focused on working with the younger generation, we chose to come to the Bay Area. So would they, when they moved out of juniors, would they then go to SoCal? Or would they stay within um, yours, your, your team? A lot of them would just stop, to be honest. Okay, yeah. They're just, I mean, just like the reason why I retired is there's just not a financial opportunity. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they don't see a long-term growth. The parents don't see that. And I think, yeah, I don't blame them. I mean, education has to become a priority at that, at that point. So sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. We talk about that um, on a couple of episodes of our podcast where, you know, we have at, at, a, at a particular point in time, usually around that high school to university transition, you, you pick a path, uh, you, you meet a crossroads and you kind yeah. of have to go, okay, what, what am I doing? What's going to be secure for me in the future based on, again, what, what our parents want for us and what our own priorities are. Um, Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of badminton players and quite talented badminton players do go down the path of academics and and going and joining the workforce afterwards, Um, which leads me to, I guess, my my next thoughts are, you know, what what can we do as a country, say Australia or or, or USA to, to change that? Um, And like, where, where are we at now? Uh, Have we improved from when you first started? playing badminton or being involved in badminton as to having those additional pathways to, for others to develop into. Um, and how far, how far do we need to go to, to actually change this? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. This is a big question. Um, (laughs) sorry, loaded question. There was like 10 questions in that question. (laughs) Yeah. So one at a time. (laughs) Um, I would say the first being, um, I can't speak so much about Australian badminton at a junior level. 
Um, but I did, we did compete against Australia and the uh, world juniors. And I could definitely tell that um, junior development wise, like the numbers have just like ballooned. So I feel that in, in America, we see a lot more kids playing and the level that they play at, at the, the young age is just phenomenal. Like it just blows my mind that like a six, seven year old is coming in and doing like net spins and, and like slice cross drops. Like I, think I, was, <laughs> I was learning how to hold my racket and like, <laughs> over the net. So <laughs> I still thought badminton was a picnic sport at that age. <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. Like I see some of these like seven, eight year olds with like their footwork looks like Lee Chung Wei, and I'm like. Like what is going on? <laughs> that, that modeling, that proximity, they've got YouTube now. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have that access before. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, just keep going. <laughs> um, but your question about how do we kind of bridge that gap? I mean, that kind of brings me to the first ever foundation. And um, yeah. we've had this issue for, for ever since I was a kid is that, okay, when you graduate high school, you have to make a choice, education or, or, or badminton. But, um, and a lot of these other bigger sports, you have an opportunity to be a student athlete, whether you're getting a scholarship from, from the college itself, or there's kind of other grants that you can apply to kind of support you on this journey. Cause I feel at that point, you shouldn't necessarily have to make the big decision in your life. Like, yes, if you're top in the world, it's an easy decision to make. Like I'm going to be a, a professional athlete yep. but if you're in the middle I think that's the time where you need this college experience to mature to grow to really like open your mind and what like kind of where are your talents at you're, we're still trying to find ourselves out yeah yep. and kind of the mission behind the first ever foundation is to hey we want these top junior players who graduate high school we want you to go to college and we're gonna give you these funds so that you can use this money to continue training, to, to go and play on the international circuit. And um, that way we kind of keep them involved in the sport. And um, hopefully that maybe they see success or maybe after they graduate from, from college or from uni that um, you know, they can pursue this career. Because if you stop for four years, you're done. You don't have a chance to kind of mm. get your level back and yeah. you can, the people that you were beating before they've been progressing. Yeah. So I think, um, obviously trying to get this as like a approved collegiate sport in America, we call it an NCAA sport. Okay. Um, what does that stand for? Uh, wow. National. You on the spot there. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go off it and I'm going to say national collegiate athletics association. That would okay. be my, right. Yeah. Best. Perfect. And, um, <laughs> So what other sports fit within that though? Just so that we know, so it's a baseball, yeah. American football, baseball, basketball, football, um, tennis, I would say squash, tennis, golf, uh, volleyball. There, there's a number of sports can, that can kind of get, um, get into those programs, but it's yep. been 20 years now where badminton has been trying to, you know, get in there. Mm. And, um, I mean, USA badminton has done a phenomenal job to grow for the last 20 years. And, um, it's not easy. I'm sure there's a lot of politics involved to kind of get into this Avenue. So my, my mind frame was, well, let me do something small on the side that can spark conversation, get some awareness and hopefully like move the needle. Yeah. And I think this could be the first start to kind of showing these young players that, Hey, there is a life after high school badminton. You can continue. Um, whether you, whether you choose to be a professional badminton player or not, at least you can be rewarded for your sacrifices of all that, all, all those years and you can still get your education. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a small contribution to kind of, changing the future for for badminton you know yeah that that's awesome and i completely agree with you raj that that age group okay so in australia we finish high school usually at 18 at mm -hmm. 18 years old mm -hmm. and that age group of one finishing high school two choosing what to do next three often moving out of home yeah it there's so much learning if i think about that age for me i can't 
like there's so much learning, just life learning that you do during that period of time. And yeah. like you said, it's so soon for them just to make a decision. Like, oh, I'm just going to choose academics. Oh, I'm just going to choose badminton. Um, yeah. And just giving them that flexibility of being able to do both so that they can find themselves, that, that's absolutely yeah. huge. And just from my story myself, um, when I was competing to try to represent Australia at the Beijing Olympics in 2008, I had already gotten into my university course and I petitioned the university to let me take the years off so that I could train and travel. And then I knew that I had university coming and that was a great comfort for me because I knew that no matter what goes on professionally in badminton, I'm going to try my very best, but I still have this other thing that I can do that I want to do as well. And I think that I'm very, very, very grateful and lucky that I had that opportunity, but by having something that where you're merging two things together, I think that that's amazing. So congratulations on that, Raja. And hopefully, like you said, having this thing, having um, the foundation work will show hopefully the people higher up in that acronym that you used. I can't remember. NCC. Yeah. We'll be able to see that. Oh, look, 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 look at these people taking on this program. It yeah. definitely is something worthy of our, of our, support and the, the credibility. So Raj, I know that you're still involved in the Bay area, but when you, when, when did you start um, the, your nonprofit, the first ever foundation and what did you kind of move away from or step away from in order for you to spend time doing this? Mm -hmm. um, the foundation launched actually this April. So it had been um, kind of two years in the making, um, but going through the whole, nonprofit process and, you know, getting everything legally done. Um, that took a while and everything was new to me. Yep. So lots of learning there and kind of just going through the, the process. I didn't want to take any shortcuts, make sure everything's uh, legit. Um, but we launched in April. So that's been amazing. The, um, we had a fundraiser on Facebook that's already kind of, we're at about almost 60% of our goal in a month. And, um, the, awesome. and given the, oh, no. given the coronavirus pandemic and yeah, you know, that's we very were, true. We were very that's nervous true. to kind of launch because, um, you know, we didn't want to come out of the, the books, like asking for people's money. Uh, you know, people are losing jobs. They're for, they're furloughed, uh, financially. It's, it's a tough situation, but yeah. you know, we thought, this is a time for us to kind of get a positive message out there. And really we just want to, you know, get some awareness out there that, Hey, mm -hmm. there's this cost coming. And a lot of our, our graduating seniors, um, you know, you, you look forward to your U 19s where you can qualify for like junior Pan American games, world juniors. Yep. Um, you have a team event. This is kind of the first time they get to be involved in a team competition, like a Thomas cup or a Suderman cup. And they lost all of that. So, I mean, imagine if you're, you've been training your whole junior career to get to this moment and you, you don't, it's kind of taken away from you. So yeah. we kind of chose that, that time to launch it and hopefully, you know, give them some hope and inspiration that, Hey, even though we missed this, you know, now moving on to college, we have this opportunity and, yeah. uh, what, you know, that now that you ask about what did I have to give up, I actually had to give up a lot. It was a very, very, very challenging uh, decision for me. It, it still weighs on me quite a bit. Um, in 2016, I got the opportunity uh, from Ben and Lan and, and Howard Bach to join Synergy Badminton Academy. And uh, wow. man, they, they blessed me with the opportunity to not only be a badminton coach, but also to be a badminton club owner mm -hmm. and yeah, well, those last three and a half years, like I just want to go through a few milestones just to kind of yeah. pay my thanks. Yeah, to please. Because, um, I graduated from college. I, I probably broke the record. It took me 15 years, but I did. It. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> yeah, good effort. Good so effort. I'm not, I'm not encouraging anyone to try to beat that record, but I that one, so. But um, I graduated college. I became a, a badminton club owner. I started a nonprofit foundation. I bought a house. Uh, I got engaged. I mean, 
that just goes that just goes to show the team that I join. I mean, look how much that uh, they helped me grow, and yeah. I'm, I'm super super grateful. Like it, all of these, you know, every opportunity you get, it's a it's a stepping stone to be better and become greater and now now that i'm older i realize that you know your platform is really important to uh you know use it to to serve others and i think my time at synergy was really really good um the the players were amazing like uh even though i coached them to help them win and improve i feel like they coached me from from a boy into a man and uh yeah, and I, I think um, it was really tough for me to kind of give that up because those are my brothers and sisters. Those players are my kids. But um, it, as I kind of, you know, evolved, the projects that I wanted to do with badminton was more uh, foundation related. And as well as um, Yonex has this uh, incredible Legends vision. And I got a chance to be an MC for that and kind of work closely with, with Peter Gay, Taufik, Lee Young Day, and uh, like Tony Gunawan, our U.S. legends. And to just try, to, to just be a part of like the Yonex Legacy Initiative, they have like this racket drive, a summer, uh, summer league coming and coaching clinics to improve um, badminton coaches at the high school level. I just found that my passion wanted to be more towards giving back and um, now that I also looking forward to starting a family I needed time and energy to be able to do those things and you know that was a that was a really really uh, tough sacrifice I had to make yeah yeah absolutely now if we kind of delve into what the foundation is about now Raj and just say for for a donor, so if, if I want to be a donor, what's the process compared to if I wanted to be an applicant? What's what's the process and what does the foundation help me with if I'm an athlete? Okay, great. Um, well, everything's on our website, www.firsteverfoundation.com. Mm-hmm. And if you're a donor, um, we have pretty much the information, what we're about, uh, kind of what I spoke about earlier in the podcast is we're really just trying to give, um, our high school players an opportunity to be a student athlete in college. And while they're, they're doing their studies, um, that they still have an opportunity to pay for their training or pay for their travel to compete internationally and get that exposure. And there's, you know, whether they choose to continue after four years or not, that's totally up to them. We still support the journey. It's still a successful uh, mission because mm-hmm. um, at the end of the day, they found out what they wanted to do. Yep. It's nice. And they can kind of leave it all on the table. Um, so that's kind of really what we're about. As a donor, we're a 501c3 um, nonprofit. So that means we're a tax exempt organization. Anything you donate can be uh, a tax write off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a few avenues to donate. You can go on our Facebook, uh, there's a fundraiser there. Um, we also have a, a donate button on the website in the top right where you can either um, donate through PayPal or you can send a check uh, to our PO box. But everything's on the website. We have an incredible uh, board of directors. Um, I, I really wanted to assemble a team that could um, choose the the best candidates for the scholarship. And me myself, I I wanted to make sure I remove myself from that, just because I've been involved with a lot of clubs and players, and um, a lot of times there are politics in badminton, and I really wanted to. I wanted there to be full transparency and not that, Hey, I used to coach at this club and uh, I have a stronger connection with these certain athletes. So I tried my best to assemble a team that is a uh, uh, very fair and neutral. They come from a very diverse background, whether they're a doctor um, from yeah. a different sport or a doctor that played badminton uh, current athletes, coaches, like it's, it's a pretty well-rounded uh, board that I think will do a great job at kind of choosing the, the next, the future champions to come. So, mm. yeah. And 
Raj, something that Jeff highlighted a bit earlier, and I'm sorry to pry deeper into the foundation. I hope, hope you're okay with me asking these kinds of questions. Um, yeah. Jeff was talking about that, that transition between high school and university. You know, these, these people or these players are very young um, mm. and they often haven't really articulated themselves or they haven't really developed themselves well enough to know what they truly want in life. I mean, I certainly... Even now, I'm kind of like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, yeah, for, for those, for those kids that are, you know, 16, 17 and looking into you know, university, looking into being a player, you know, they're often heavily influenced by the people around them and, and specifically their parents mm-hmm. and being an Asian dominated sport. Um, mm-hmm. so what is the foundation doing to engage with those decision makers? Cause that, that, that's where I guess I would think um, is re- really important um, to get them on board as well. Mm-hmm. At this point, we haven't had much kind of outreach on that. Um, I mean, we've just launched, but I, I guess I could talk a little bit as coaches. Um, so we're all pretty well connected throughout the country and, I think that kind of education towards the parents and the players really comes from the coaches and uh, USA Badminton mm-hmm. because they have a constant communication with them and kind of develop develop the player. So, I mean, I've reached out to some of the club owners and the head coaches to kind of share that information with the players because um, I also don't want to overstep any, any kind of boundaries. But um, yeah. I think that that really has to come uh, from from their from their own head coaches, and yeah, we do have some. We're av- we, we're available if anybody had questions to reach out, and you know, obviously, we would love to help. But we haven't really dove into too much of uh, kind of how we could guide them at this point. Uh, hopefully, in the future, we could host maybe some some kind of like if there's some kind of collaboration with Yonix or USA Badminton that we could do some kind of training camps or even just like, I, I really like doing speaking engagements just cause um, it's just a chance to share the vulnerable side. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure Jeff knows too. Is like when you, when you, when we are at the top of our career and you go play, like, I feel like sometimes the kids just think that we got, that good like we just woke yeah, up yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of the same insecurities as they do mm-hmm. and i think like um yeah there needs to be more kind of events like that where we can really we can really get like one-on-one with them yeah absolutely yeah uh just I'll, I'll come over and and talk to the kids as well just let me know when yeah no, no. tell them about those ants <laughs> tell them about those ants man <laughs> something i just learned about today but like the, <laughs> um, yeah so so raj for someone applying for example um have you given anyone any have you accepted anyone into the the foundation yet that's, that's kind of like the first question. And then how does it look for them? Do they, can they pick any school that they want to go to? Is it certain mm-hmm. schools? And then in terms of the traveling and the training, the helping with them financially, is it more, Hey, here's this much money, do what you need to do with it. Or is it, Hey, go do what you need to do. Send us things back and we'll reimburse you. How, how does it look mm-hmm. like for them? So right now our kind of application window is still open. Mm-hmm. It's open till June 14th. And sure. then at at that time that will close and the board of directors will review all the applicants and um, possibly any, they might set up some kind of like um, interviews with the final candidates to just really see um, who's the, who's the right one. Kind of just like how, how you would apply to colleges. Sometimes yeah. they'll be in for an interview and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of uh, that, that process will finish June 14th and, uh, our goal was to present it at the junior nationals, which was at the end of June. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen. So mm. we may have to do, um, if we're back up and running and the players are training, maybe we could do like a surprise entrance into their club, oh, yeah, that'd their, be, family, their team. And that'd you know, be so them. cool. Yeah. Or maybe like a virtual kind of thing. Virtual. Yeah. Um, what was the second question again? Oh, so do they have to choose certain school? Can they go to any school? And how does the funding help them? Is it one big, uh, what, is it one lump sum or is it a reimbursement? 
So the funding will be $5,000 for one boy and one girl. And this is mm -hmm. for each year of their uh, university. Yeah. So mm -hmm. over the four years, they'll receive $20,000. Sure. Yeah. And the way it's going to work is um, basically we'll reimburse you for your expenses. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say if you're training at your own badminton club, you can just uh, send in the receipt or the invoice that shows, hey, I've been training with this club under this coach and we can reimburse them that way. Or if there were expenses from um, the tournament, uh, they can send in those receipts and we can reimburse reimburse them there and there'll be a few kind of metrics that we want them to follow as far as like hey you guys should be able to keep maintain this great point average yep. um yep. college uh we also have like a requirement that they must compete in four international tournaments a year mm -hmm. um because we really want them to get out there and yeah, get absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, they need that yep yeah, they need that and to kind of develop and see what it is, right? A lot of these kids haven't really, like, they haven't seen, um, they, they, they've seen tournaments, but they haven't seen an event, right? Yeah. And it's overwhelming. Like, you get onto the circuit and it tests your confidence like that. I'll go back. You feel like an ant. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> In size as well as uh, negative thoughts, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll get this $5,000 per year. And there's these kind of few metrics on how many hours they need to train, how many tournaments, yep. their grades, just yep. to make sure that uh, we're checking in, that they're doing a good job. And, and, and there's some, there's some leniency. It's not like, Hey, you mess up once and you're out. Obviously like we're growing, like you never fail. You just learn the lesson, right? It's, I mean, you gotta, you gotta give them some room to make some mistakes and learn mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it'll be a good journey. And hopefully um, as the foundation continues to grow, we can up that, that amount of money that they receive, you know? And uh, we also want to grow big enough to when they graduate college that we have um, another kind of stipend that can, like a 5,000 could go to them as a, as a professional athlete, you know, to support their training and competing uh, thereafter, you know? Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure where to go from here. I think I feel yeah. I feel like Raj has, has answered all that, that questions yeah, about everything. the foundation. Oh, and I, I was studying hard for today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wait, so they can do they can they basically can any, any school, any and they can train in any club. It doesn't they can train in any club. Yep. You just have to go to a four year college. So Okay. Yeah. Um the reason being um, that is I went to community colleges, which is these small schools that you go for two years and you get to transfer sure. to the uni. Right. And I think for me, what was challenging was that a lot of people going to those community colleges, they're not fully committed. I'm just speaking from my experience. I didn't, yeah. I didn't sense a full yeah. commitment and that impacted me because I also, you know, it took me 15 years. So I didn't stick the Only route. 15. Only yeah. 15. I ventured out, I came back and I couldn't, you know, I didn't commit. And I, and just to experience like, Hey, you're a freshman, you're going to go in and you're going to build your network of friends. Like these are these, these are your friends for probably the next 10 years of your life. Like the friends that you made that you grew up with. Now everyone's going to different parts of the world or the country and this is your chance to really like develop the next 10 years of your life. And I think that's very, very valuable for them. And that's really why we wanted um, them to go to a four year college or a four year mm -hmm. university so that they can kind of really, um, you know, experience that. So, yeah. And that proximity again, isn't it? Yeah, it's being, it about, is. being in that environment where people are pushing themselves and they're striving for excellence. Yeah. And of course the saying that goes by your direct reflection of the five people you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because yeah, just proximity. I think just yeah. summary, summary of this podcast, proximity and ants, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the cool thing about it is you can go to any college, you can train at any club. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. we're, we're just here as a, a support system. We're not yeah. Uh, yeah. taking any athletes or anything. We're just here to support everyone. 
Sure. And would that help them with like physio or sports psychology or anything like that? Yeah. Anything related to badminton, do it by all means, like whatever Mm -hmm. it takes to, to get you to become the greatest version of yourself, go for it. Yeah. 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 It's nice that it's such a versatile program that caters to the, I guess it looks at individuals holistically um, because yeah, not everyone's going to go to, you know, an Ivy league college, they might go to a community college and you can really engage with anyone that where, where there is that talent and, and that potential um, to become a professional badminton player as well as, you know, do well in academics. So you're talking about, you know, 10 years time, in terms of 10 years time from now, where do you see the foundation? What, what, what does it look like to you? Well, this is a very optimistic dream, but um, Love it. our goal is to win an Olympic gold medal in 2028 in Los Angeles. So yeah. this yeah. foundation, we really wanted to launch um, last year. So we kind of had this like nine to 10 years to, um, you know, prepare for that. Mm-hmm. And that's really where this foundation comes into play is like, Hey, we have these 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds. Like they're so talented. They have this vision. They can, they can win a gold medal, like talent wise, they can win it. Now the key yeah. is, do they have the right people around them? Do they have mm-hmm. the right resources around them to, to nurture them along this whole path? Because if you don't have that, the ants come into play and they're just going to eat you alive. Right. (laughs) This is is going to be a thing. You're going to say this all the time. (laughs) This is so good. (laughs) Don't let the ants squash you. (laughs) Don't let the ants eat you. But but really that's what it is. You know, like we have to be able to have these kind of places and put in place for them. But um, yeah, in 10 years, that's really my, my mission is to get an Olympic medal for an American player. And it doesn't matter if I'm a coach, if it's through the foundation, if it's, um, you know, just giving them advice off the court. Like, I just want to be a part of that journey. And um, that's, that's where I see the foundation going in 10 years is that we've gone through multiple generations where the athletes have a college degree. They're now a professional badminton player. They got the scholarship. Um, the game has changed. Like, uh, we have a national team. Um, I just see all those things happening. Like I really do see an Olympic medal. Like I I've been dreaming of that through my affirmations of that, you know, I'm going to see the Olympic medal in, um, 2028. And I've, I've been talking to these, uh, graduating seniors and younger, and I've kind of that seed that my dad planted in me, I've been planting that seed in them and my goal is to try to water that seed and nurture that for the next eight years and try to manifest it, man. And then we'll get back on the podcast in 2028 and celebrate (laughs) before that, before that as well. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Oh, Raj, this is awesome. This discussion has been awesome and it makes me kind of, Henry, we should start a, a non-profit here, but yeah, <laughs> a absolutely. few things on our plate. 2020, yeah. We'll be on the podium too. Yeah. <laughs> With yeah, battle, go. Gold medal match. Yeah. We'll be in there. Yeah. <laughs> Senior Olympics. <laughs> yeah. um, Raj. Yeah. So we've been talking for about an hour now and it's gone literally like this yeah. because yeah, we have just, yeah, it's just been such an awesome discussion. And I know that there were a few things that before we, we start to wrap up here, there were a few things that you really wanted to tell the listeners about, about, basically what have been really important things for you and what they could potentially take away from this, this video or this podcast um, yeah. that they can action right away. That's going to help them in their lives, whether it be in their badminton or in their career or academics, etc. Yeah, most definitely. Um, there, there's, there's three small things that I would encourage all of us to do, whether we're an athlete or, you know, we're just striving to become, the best version of ourself. And the first being is kind of having a, for me, what works is having a a morning routine. Um, I wake up in the morning. I have a journal that I write in. If you guys have never um, explored, there's a journal called the five minute journal and you start each day with a, with a quote and um, three things that you're grateful for. And I think a lot of times we get so busy in, in life and we get caught up and we, 
you forget to kind of reflect on, hey, there's a lot of good things that are coming my way or that's going on. So I get a chance to start each day with uh, things I'm grateful for. You also write down um, what you would like to accomplish that day. There's three things that you write to accomplish. And then after that is a, an, a daily affirmation. And for me, um, confidence is, is a big factor as we continue to maneuver and, you know, tackle on um, bigger challenges. And your confidence is tested every day. And I think, um, you know, just the power of affirmations, it just gives you that, uh, that comfort knowing like, Hey, you can do it. And it's, you're just practicing self-belief and you may never master it. It's a, I, I feel it's a thing that you have to do daily, but, um, starting your morning like that, uh, journaling and with affirmations, I found that like super, super powerful. And, uh, the last is meditation every day. I, I start my day with a meditation. And that's just kind of a day for me to kind of center myself, um, really get all my thoughts out and clear my head. And it just brings a, a sense of positive energy. And, uh, you know, to start your day like that before everything is like crazy, whether it's traffic or mm. uh, you got a test or homework or your parents yelled at you, whatever it is, like you're already in a Zen mode, like you can't be touched, you know? <laughs> So the the first I would say is I try to establish, maybe choose one of those one things from the morning routine. But if you guys ever check out that five minute journal, like, man, it's a life changer. Like I'm on my, I'm on my third one already. I've only done it. Like I never journaled through my whole junior athletic career. And I just started about a year and a half ago. And it's just an amazing, it's an amazing tool. Um, uh, The second is, for me, uh, as an athlete, we're taught to always win. All that matters is winning. Like if you, if you really look at it, like, okay, from the public eye or from the kids, like they look at who's the winner. And a lot of times we get stuck on, Hey, you, you, you judge yourself by winning. So when you lose, it's tough. It's tough. And I think you got to turn your L's into lessons. That's one of the, the quotes that I like to think of. And yeah. this, the second point I would like you guys to take away is to have a triple E attitude. And what that is, is like in anything you do have energy, excitement, and eagerness, like that's, what's going to separate you from everyone. You're going to, whether you go into a, a big college um, or you're on a professional circuit or you're in this huge corporate job, like now you're in a, you're in a group of all talented people of all superheroes. Now, now what's going to separate you? Like you have to have something far beyond what your skills can do. And for me, that's attitude, right? That's when you, when you fail, you got to keep the same attitude as when you're winning. And if you can do that, like it's only a matter of time before you're successful. So, you know, I've kind of really like ran with that and, you know, I've, I've told the players that, but um, I try to be the living example of that. So in everything I do, I give, I give a triple E attitude. And then the last, um, you know, now that I'm a lot older, I have a lot of time to reflect and look back. And I realize that this is bigger than badminton. What I'm doing is bigger than badminton. There's a purpose. And um, one of my, my inspirational leaders, Oprah Winfrey, <clears throat> I was listening to her podcast. She, well, it's not really a podcast. She was giving a graduation speech at a college. And her quote was, uh, success is not measured by um, how many awards you win or how much money you make. It's about, you know, how many lives you touch. And and man, that hit me like a brick to the face. Like Mm -hmm. it woke me up. And I was like, all these times, like a lot of times I'm just, I just want to win and I want to be successful. But in reality, it is like, what am I using my platform for? Like, how am I impacting others' lives? How am I serving the community? And that's where the foundation was born. Like this idea and this dream of the foundation came because I realized that there is a bigger purpose for me. And it wasn't just that I'm a badminton player or I'm a badminton coach. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, it's great. There's so many great athletes and coaches, but I, I just realized that my, my purpose kind of have e- had evolved beyond that. Hmm. 
that I could be in kind of a, um, an avenue where I could support those athletes and I could support those coaches and support the sport to grow and an avenue that maybe um, others don't have the time to do it. And I think that if we all can kind of think of, Hey, we're all gifted. We're all talented. We all have our own superpowers. We're all unique. We're quirky. And once we can kind of accept those and um, channel that and realize that, Hey, you got a bigger purpose. Like you're here for a reason that that's when um, your true talent will come out, you know? Mm. So I would say if they can take away those three things like journaling, um, the triple E attitude and just, you know, think about the bigger picture. It's not about, uh, it's not about winning and losing, you know, it's, you, you don't need to compare yourself to others. You're out to be the best version of yourself. Nobody can be you. Only you can be that person. Mm. And I think if we can take those three things away, like, man, the, the end is like limitless, you know? Yeah, absolutely. They're, yeah. I can't, can't reiterate those points any more than you actually have because I've done a lot of these in my life and I just wanted to share that on my mirror, um, just with a whiteboard marker so I can rub it off. I have some, a series of questions I ask myself every morning when I wake up and it's right in front of me. So I have to, yeah. and one of the, yeah, it, it is about that. It is what, what, it, what is going to be great about today? What am I grateful for today? What do I love about myself today? Um, yeah. a, a lot of these different questions that get you in that kind of mindset when you start the day. And that, that morning routine and the routine that you do is so important because it's not, it's, it's always the analogy of it's not what you do. It's how often and consistently you do it. Um, it's like brushing your teeth, me being a dentist. If you brush your teeth once, what does it do? Nothing. Honestly, it doesn't do much, but it's the day in day out that you're brushing twice a day, you're flossing twice a day that has the long-term effect. And it, I think it's very similar for this. So you, you might not feel the straight away that it's amazing for you, but it is that consistent repetition that will see the, the results at the end of the day. Yeah. And we yeah. can't be afraid to fail. Like mm. no one's going to judge you when, um, when you have that mindset, like when, when you're just so driven and you're so positive, like no one's going to judge you when you fail, you know, you're just trying new things, learning new things. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Right. So for everyone listening who potentially wants to follow how the first ever foundation is going or follow your journey and just see how they can contribute, even if someone's listening, they haven't applied and yet they've got about a month to apply yet. Yeah. How do they get in contact with you or the foundation? Uh, wow. There's multiple avenues. Um, we have the website again is www.firsteverfoundation.com. Uh, you can check us on our Facebook page, uh, first ever foundation. Um, you can email us at info at first ever foundation.com. And then if you wanted to reach out to me personally, obviously I'm on Facebook. Um, Raji Poo 33 on Instagram. So. Raji Poo. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, anything we can help. Um, I really want to put out a big thanks for you guys, uh, Jeff and Henry, the badminton podcast, um, not only for giving me the platform kind of to share my story because it's very therapeutic for me too. It helps with my, my kind of confidence and figuring out more about myself, but, I think what you guys are doing um, for the sport, whether it's through the podcast or Volant Wear, um, that I commend you guys because um, it, it's not an easy journey. And um, I think those that, ants are everywhere as well. But yeah, <laughs> sorry, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, just to see two people with like this great mindset and this great purpose, and uh, you know, I just want you guys to know that you have a big cheerleader here uh, rooting for you guys and anything I can do on my end to kind of, you know, push that needle forward and spread that awareness. I would love to do that as well. So I really appreciate the time you guys uh, and the opportunity. Thank you, Raj. And <sighs> Thanks, I think man. it's, yeah, it was really nice to hear your, your three take home messages. And um, I certainly think it's something that, uh, that really helped me listening to it in this podcast. So thank you for that as well yeah. and yeah we do really appreciate you coming onto the podcast so thanks again for coming on 
You're welcome. I'm going to log on and buy a t-shirt. So just oh. late. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, man. You thanks. don't have to. But. No, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank, thanks for the support. Look, it, <laughs> Thank you. It, it does mean a lot to us. Um, Henry and I, especially during the times now we're on zoom, not every day, but many days of the week, figuring out what we're doing. And a lot of our mind power is revolved around the podcast and the brand Volant where to see what else we can do, what, what we can do to make it better. Um, that's yeah. definitely something that, yeah. And just getting a bit of feedback is, yeah, it's, it's very touching and yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the, thanks for the love, man. Honestly, thanks yeah, so much for the love. Also big love to Yonex. They've been supporting me. For, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no, 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 no absolutely. They, they, sure. yeah. they, they've, uh, they've nurtured me from 2003 as a player, as a coach, mm. and now as an ambassador, like, man, it's just so, it's, it's such a pleasure to be a part of a, a brand like that, that can invest in you. And I feel like, um, kind of the message that you guys have to Volant wear, I kind of see that as well. So I hope in 10 years time that, um, you know, you guys got this brand like kicking butt out here on, uh, the global circuit, you know, that's, that's the vision. That's, that's the vision of the, the badminton events where, a lot yep. of the banners okay. around the courts are of the and yeah. yeah, just, just building that brand and the community up. So yeah, yeah. No, that, that's, that's the goal. That's the definitely in the vision. Yeah. And we H- talk about the, the bigger purpose, right? It's not just the, it's not just sure. about the badminton. It's about, yeah. it's about the connecting of, of people and welcoming people to the sport and sure. yeah, just connecting players and bridging the gaps of all levels. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was always my vision. I just want to let you in on a secret on Henry's vision that we would have our, our offices on one floor and then upstairs will be badminton courts that anyone, playing, <laughs> any, anyone, anyone working can just go and play whenever. That's the dream. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw out an offer. Like when um, my fiance and I will go visit Australia, hopefully we can, sit down in person and do another uh, chat. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I'd absolutely. love that. Honestly, I'd love that. So, yeah. So in regards to Esther and let, let's hopefully we'll see you guys soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Raj, thanks again for being on the podcast. It's been an awesome episode and for everyone listening, thanks so much for tuning in to either the video on YouTube that you may be watching now or the podcast in itself, because We've gone into things that are very deep and not only in respects of badminton, but what the, I don't, as cliche as it sounds, what the meaning is of life and what, what impact you're going to leave, what legacy you're going to leave behind. Um, because uh, we've, Tenure and I have totally spoke about this before. If you end your life, with, so not if you end your life, it sounds terrible, but <laughs> at the end of your, at the end of your life, if you're, life was represented by a photo album, which pictures would you want to see in that album? And it's those pictures that we're creating every day that's going to end up in our album at the end of our lives. So it is really about that. Um, it's about ants and just knowing that there are ants out there and we just need to manage it, manage them. And yeah. And the first ever foundation, which is an awesome initiative. And like I said, I'd love to start one here. And it sounds like such a a rewarding experience for you, even though it did take a long time set up. So thanks for the support from the badminton community, especially in the U S but across the world, because I'm sure your story is going to inspire many of us. So everyone out there listening, make sure you share this podcast with everyone that you know, um, because it's of such great value and get out there Keep sharing your love of the sport of for badminton because badminton really is for everyone and we want everyone to see how amazing it is. And if you want to connect with us, you can connect with us via Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, TikTok, various social media channels via our social media handle, Volantware, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. Or if you want to pick up some really cool gear, go to our website, www.volantware.com. And as always, feel free to reach out to us with any feedback you have, good or bad. And whether you want to jump onto the podcast, have a chat with us, like we said, it's about not just professional players like Raj, but you know, social, competitive, professional. We want to bridge that gap and share everyone's badminton stories and just connect. So yeah, get in contact with us and uh, we'll see you on the next episode.
Thanks, guys. Thanks, Raj. Love it. Such a good episode. Thanks. Awesome. (laughs) Thanks so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video podcast, please make sure you like it, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. You can also find the link to the audio podcast in the description below. And as always, let's show the world how incredible badminton is.